From the Open Season Property Studios, welcome to Super Talk Outdoors, where we celebrate every single Monday at lunchtime the world class outdoors of the state of Mississippi, because this is the capital of the outdoors in America. Thank you for joining us on the powerful Super Talk Mississippi Radio Network. You can listen to Super Talk Outdoors on supertalk.fm, Amazon Alexa, the Super Talk Mississippi app. And as always, on your local Super Talk Mississippi channel across the state of Mississippi or on Super Talk TV at Seaspire TV. Or you might be watching the show on YouTube or Facebook or listening on your favorite podcast. It's April the 15th, 2024. As I mentioned, uh, I'm doing the show today from the Open Seasons Property Studio. We are so thrilled to have them as a, as a title sponsor. Open Season Properties is a full-service real estate company with a team approach philosophy that ensures your needs are the highest priority, whether it's rural land sales, residential or commercial properties. Open Season uh, Properties markets and sells real estate in Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia. And they're dedicated to the development of long-term client relationships and unwavering uh, commitment to service. Go to openseasonproperties.com to learn more. Anyway, we're so thrilled to have them. And also, the Mississippi Land Bank is a presenting sponsor along with Open Season Properties, Jordan Blissett and Austin Seals. We'll tell you more about them as the show goes on today. Hey, listen, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach today. Uh, I've invited someone uh, who, like you, uh, like many of you, have been watching closely the noise in Mississippi these days around so many things we need to be focused on, whether it's down here on the coast with uh, with the Breton Sound Diversion Project or, or the Bonnie Carey Spillway or issues on the commission or whether it's, uh, you know, the bills that would proclaim wildlife belong to the people in Mississippi. People are paying more attention and uh and this, this, my guest today is someone who has been watching uh, all of this as well. His name is Reed Geis. He's an award-winning ad agency owner. His voice has been used on countless commercials. But more important, he loves the outdoors. He, he hunts deer and turkey and ducks. And he's an accomplishment and record-holding fly fisherman. And he's traveled the, wor the world uh, with his friend David Sheffield, fly fishing in so many different situations. David, incidentally, is a movie writer. And he's a former writer for Saturday Night Live. And he's from Gulfport, which is uh, a little bit ironic oh, about that. He's also an advocate. Uh, Reed is also an adv advocate for Mississippi's outdoors. He pays very close attention to issues facing us as outdoorsmen and women in the state. As I said, a growing number of us are doing these days. So without any further ado, let me welcome my friend, Reed Geis, to Super Talk Outdoors. Reed, how you doing, my friend? Doing great. Thanks. Thanks, Ricky. I, I, I was telling you, I just got back from a trip uh, to Belize, to uh, uh, San Pedro in Ambergris Key. Uh, I had two days of fishing. My, my wife, uh, Susan, and my 17-year-old, Breton, did a lot of diving there. Breton did his first night dive. Uh, he said it was just terrific. I mean, he, he, was, he was just really fired up about it. And yeah, we, yeah. What'd you catch? Caught some bonefish. Uh, and also, I was able to land a permit, which is sort of the holy grail for uh, saltwater flats fishermen. Um, it, it's a very difficult fish to, 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 to catch. It's just very difficult fish. Many, many have tried, few have succeeded. <laughs> Yeah, you you like you, I mean, listen, read read. Let's let's be clear. You, you have uh, you you have multiple records here in Mississippi, and you're an accomplished fly fisherman in Mississippi. But when you go around the world, you get that diversity. But that there's something about Belize and flats fishing that's yeah. been really appealing to you, isn't it? Oh, it really is. And then uh, I, I flats fished uh, down in Key West. Um, and, and all the way into the Marquesas uh, from Key West it is beautiful in Alamarada, Belize. Um, oh, and, and the Bahamas, too, out, out of uh, Marsh Harbor in the Bahamas. Um, also, Homosassa, which is the home of the giant tarpon. I was able wow. to catch a tarpon there. They estimated it was 140 pounds. Wow. Quite a fight. I mean, the, the huge, huge tarpon there. And also huge hammerheads. That are there to try to eat them. I mean, big, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> big. It. Yeah, I have seen. I've seen videos of that for sure. But you know, Reed, you've had you've had the opportunity to, as I said, you've enjoyed duck hunting and deer hunting and 
turkey hunting. You've you've kind of done it all. Uh, but fly fishing is your love. I mean, you're you're quite accomplished, actually. You're, you're how do you say it? you're you're a master fly fisherman, or how does it, how do they talk about it? I'm a certified casting instructor. Yeah. Uh, by the the Fly Fishing International, the uh, uh, certification. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I enjoy helping other people um, uh, learn how to cast mo better. How uh, how how many state records have you had along the way? Oh, I've, I've had a dozen, I guess, and, and I've broken my own record several times. Now I think I only hold three. Yeah. Uh, one for spade fish, of all things. Yeah, I caught a spade fish on a fly. Uh, was it Almaco Jack and uh, Mahi Mahi? Yeah, so, well, that, those, are, those are good ones. My son Jordan, I think, still holds the record for hard hat catfish. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, uh, I remember when you set the record for Benito. Yeah, on a fly rod. Yeah. yeah. And then, let's see, he's got several other records, but not on fly rods. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, fun, it's a fun pursuit when you're out there and you, and you keep that fly rod nearby. You have an opportunity to break a record, man. It's a lot of fun to go after him, isn't it? Oh, it is. It's a ball. It really is. So, so we, you know, you and I, during this conversation, we'll chat about We'll chat about lots of things. Um, you know, I've watched you over over many years of success in your ad agency, working on so many amazing things. I mean, you've uh, you've got a you're, you've got a daughter who's doing some really good work these days in L.A. She's a she's a I would say she's a, a, a kind of a, a, a carbon copy of her mother and her father, and what she's doing in L.A. She's taking it to the next level, isn't she, buddy? Oh, it's amazing. You know, she, actually, um, it's the uh, uh, she runs uh, the um, um, the most successful uh, firm of its kind in all of California. Um, she just finished doing the promos for the Oscars. Uh, she did the promos for the Oscars last year, and she does work for um, uh, so many other people, like uh, the the um, the Kardashians. She's done stuff on the Bachelor and uh, the Bachelorette and. Um, a lot of work for Disney, a lot of work for Disney and ABC. Yeah, it's a, it's incredible to watch her success. You know, I follow her on Instagram and it's just, you know, it's amazing. When you, when you think she's reached a new height, she, she reaches even further. Yeah. And then you've got a son that's like, he is like a master furniture maker, isn't he? Oh, incredible craftsman, you know, very gifted craftsman. His work is, is just astonishing and he, he ships it all over the nation. Um, um, he's, he's got uh, quite a following, uh, just terrific work, terrific work. So, so Reed, when you think about the, the work of our commission, the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks Commission, your focus has been in our private conversations uh, before we did the show on, you know, you just, you believe strongly that transparency is the key to success, that we've got to have the public conversations. We've got to protect the public trust. Um, you know, what, what, what were some of your thoughts about that? Well, absolutely. Uh, whatever uh, is, is being done that affects our lives, particularly our sporting lives, needs to be done in, in the, uh, the, the light of day. Um, I don't know what kind of things are going on in back rooms, but um, uh, it, it appears that, that something's going on that we need to know more about. And I don't think anybody knows more about it than you do. Yeah, I think here's the thing. I think that us talking about it on the show has – has made them think twice about any backroom conversations. Uh, I have a sense that a growing number of commissioners want to do the right thing. And, I, and as you know from our conversations as well, that chronic wasting disease is something they're, they're, they've had some struggles with. They have an yeah. initial chronic wasting disease plan, but they've, they've, uh, they've made changes on a whim more than once that have affected our ability to manage that plan. And it's it's something we've we've really got to get on top of. And at the end of the day, we got to listen to our biologists, don't we? Yeah, we do. And uh, chronic wasting disease. I don't know if all of your listeners are, are familiar with with, uh, with some of the facts about it. And I, I really don't know that much either, except I know it kills them. Um, and I think that that um, uh, when you have a situation where uh, the animals congregate, like say over a, a feed uh, 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 or somebody a feeder. Uh, that that's where that can happen. They can just just from their saliva, right? They can pass yes. another another uh, animal. Um, yeah, it could actually destroy our herd. Yeah, it is a. It's, someone said on my show that it is the 
it is the one thing that could sink uh, deer hunting in America as we know it. And it's something we've really got to be focused on. There's a growing number of counties uh, in Mississippi that are reporting chronic waste. And your point about feed, something they talked about in the last meeting, but I think the commission is going to have to really focus on, you know, where do we want to go as it relates to fun, uh, supplemental feeding in Mississippi? I mean, there's some tough decisions to be made, but there's also growing science of, around it. One of the things I note is that states that are having success managing CWD these yeah. days, we're able to learn from them. So when we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with uh, Reed Geis. We'll see you after this. Great. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. I have my friend Reed Geis with me, and I'm really thrilled that we have as uh, one of our one of our presenting sponsors, uh, Mississippi Land Bank. Are, are you looking to purchase the perfect piece of hunting property, as as my friends recently did, uh, using the land bank, uh, or upgrade your farm equipment, or have uh, have you been dreaming of owning your slice of heaven out in the country? Look no further than Mississippi Land Bank for your financing needs. For more than a hundred years. Uh, farming families and landowners in North Mississippi have turned to Mississippi Land Bank for all kinds of financial solutions, whether it's for land, equipment, or livestock. For more information, visit mslandbank.com or go by and see one of their friendly staff at any of their offices across the state of Mississippi. Yeah, we're thrilled to have Mississippi Land Bank as a presenting sponsor of Super Talk Outdoors. Now back to my friend uh, Reed Geis. Hey, Reed, before we go any further, I just yeah. thought I'd mention <clears throat> someone sent me a note and said, "Where do I think the nom the uh, confirmation as it relates to Leonard Benz? Where do where do I think that's going to go?" And to be honest with you, I'm not sure. I hear different things swirling about this. That uh, essentially the Senate's Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Committee. Will either consider a nomination or consider a confirmation, and either vote them up or down, or maybe they won't won't even consider it. If they don't, then uh, that that confirmation will die, and the governor will have to select someone else. But the rumors are flying. What will happen? Does does, does the governor still support Bents, or has he grown tired of the noise? Will Senate leadership even consider the confirmation? or just let it buy, die, as I mentioned. What will come of the baiting investigation? That is a case, as I've mentioned already uh, uh, on shows past, that's still open it's Still open today. That, that investigation is ongoing. Uh, it's rumored that, that one or more commissioners are waiting for the outcome of this. I think some are even questioning whether they stay on the commission or not. And uh, I'm sure that there are some employees who wonder as well. I think you know the thought of five more years of the noise and disruption is something that people are really, really concerned about. So when is enough enough? The, question, the answer to the question, I'm not sure, but we will find out in the next couple of weeks as the Senate uh, Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Commission kind of takes this up. So, so Reed, coming back to you, yeah. you know, um, so, you know, we'll, we'll stay focused on uh, here on the show. You, you remember when I was at the Sun Herald, you watched, uh, you watched this uh, closely, especially after Hurricane Katrina, oh boy. as we shine the light on issues. There's something incredibly powerful about shining the light, isn't there, buddy? There is. And, and uh, as I understand it, you've been um, uh, uh, shot at a, a few times over this. Um, I uh, have they missed so far? <laughs> well, you know, what Reed is referring to is what regular listeners know about, and that is there there was a pretty significant effort to uh, to, to stop the funding for this show and to impact this show. And uh, <clears throat> as I said, we're bringing on new sponsors and things are fine. The, the show is very healthy. In fact, the very first phone call that went to the, the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Foundation was from Bents himself to the former executive editor, executive director, mm -hmm. um, uh, Don Brazel. And, uh, but anyway, the, you know, long and short of it is there's been a lot of pressure to silence our voice. But at the end of the day, we're, we're an independent voice. Super Talk uh, and, and I stand very strong. We haven't blinked. And we're, we're going to continue to stay focused on maintaining an independent voice and, and looking out for conservation and wildlife management in our state. And I, I love it that a growing number of people have joined us in this effort. And we're doing well. And, uh, you know, Reed, you, you know this again from my time at the Sun Herald. It's, it's not unusual for people to try to silence voices. This is this comes with the territory. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a seasoned pro when it comes to understanding that. 
Yeah, you, you've taken some shots over the years. There's no doubt about it. There, <laughs> there is no doubt about that for sure. <laughs> hey, listen, um, we were, you, you know, anything else about, uh, oh, I, by the way, I should also point out that the, the um, public trust doctrine, this bill that passed the House, 117 to zero that went to the Senate, and um, it was to proclaim wildlife belonged to the people. It died in the Senate committee. And I'm still trying to learn more, but essentially along the way, I had a I had a conversation with Neil Whaley, the chairman of the Senate Wildlife Committee, and he told me that there were some issues with the bill. There was a statue that was referred to in the House version of the bill that may not have defined wildlife correct or, or something like that. I, I immediately got with James Cummings from Wildlife Mississippi. Uh-huh. Uh, he's also the president of the National Boone, Boone and Crockett Club from Mississippi. You know, he's from Mississippi, but he's over the North American organization, the largest conservation organization in the United States. And he's written a book on the North American wildlife model. And he did some work with his lawyers and, and made a, 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 an adjustment in the bill that would have corrected the concern, or we believe it would have connected the concern, corrected the concern that uh, that Neil Whaley had. He sent it to Neil Whaley. For best I know, he didn't hear back from Neil Whaley. He resent it again. He copied uh, Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman. He didn't hear back from from any of them. And essentially, the bill died in committee. So we're not sure why. You know, did did deer breeders raise uh, up and say we don't want that bill to pass? Because it would essentially say that bill would have said wildlife belonged to the people, and the uh, the sale and transfer of wildlife would not be able, you know, we wouldn't be able to do that. So, uh, you know, we got a lot more to learn about it, but uh, it's extremely disappointing that a bill that came out of the House 117 to zero with that kind of support wouldn't get at least out of committee and to some kind of conference discussion between the Senate and the House to see if they could overcome the language about this. Uh, Neil Whaley told me he didn't want to pass a fluff bill that didn't do anything, and I agree with him. The bill had to do something. And uh, so we still still need to learn more about why that that bill got hung up in the Senate. I mean, maybe it's because they're busy. Maybe because with all these <laughs> other issues they're facing, they uh, you know that th- this issue just didn't rise as a priority. But I think wildlife issues in general, conservation issues, hunter and fisherman issues generally need to be given more attention. And you know, I'm I'm a little disappointed we don't have sort of the day to day. Uh, representation of the hunting and fishing community at the Mississippi legislature. Uh, I wonder about the Legislative Sportsman's Caucus. You know, what role do they play? Um, there's a lot of work I think we need to do. We can't, you know, this show, it's got to be more than me talking about it. There needs to be organizations involved because on the other side of this, let's say the deer kings or the deer breeders, they have lobbyists. And we don't, you know, you know we don't have the kind of day-to-day lobbying for conservation the way that I think we need it. So there's work to be done. Anyway, anything else, Ray, before we shift gears? Yeah, it's such a basic right. Um, uh, when, when people came to this land here from, from Europe and, and from uh, England, uh, all, of the, the, uh, all of the game belonged to the king. I mean, or, or the royalty. Whoever, whoever is in charge, it didn't belong to the people. And if you took some of the king's game, you, you know, you could possibly be on. Uh, so when they come to the Americas, yes, it's a basic right that these animals belong to the people of America. Uh, they don't belong to the crown. You know, they're not crown animals. They're animals for us, for all of us. Well, that, that's why we refer to them as deer kings, because uh, there are only six deer breeders in Mississippi. And uh, I refer to them as deer kings because they want to be able to own the wildlife themselves. And your point is well taken. Uh, when Aldo Leopold wrote the North American Wildlife Model, he made mm-hmm. transformed conservation efforts across the United States. Mississippi adopted the North American Wildlife Model here, which is the reason we've been able to bring back turkey populations and deer populations and other other wildlife populations. We've really taken a, a very significant conservation oriented approach to managing that wildlife. And, and and it assumes that wildlife belong to the people. We shouldn't really even need a bill that says wildlife right. belong to the people. It should be right. inherent in the constitution of the state of Mississippi. But because the deer breeders were able to get the attorney general to issue a resolution or a, a, issue a, a, an opinion 
that reversed a previous opinion written by Jim Hood. It was an incredibly good opinion that said that wildlife belonged to the people, and this was not a decision the commission could make. Once they uh, were able to get a, a uh, an opinion that reversed Jim Hood's opinion, it put in the hands of a five-member commission. They only needed three votes in order to, to change the course of history, to make the, the transfer and legal selling of deer capable, uh, uh, you know, in Mississippi. Um, hopefully, hopefully we can somehow put that to bed. I think chronic wasting disease is, is a big issue for the for the deer breeders. If you look at the USGS map that we've shared yeah. on previous shows, it shows how uh, CWD through uh, through the transfer of deer have been a major contributor to injecting CWD into the heartland of America. If we'll just manage CWD properly. We wouldn't ever uh, uh, enable the sale and transfer of deer in Mississippi, but still they work. They still work behind the scenes to uh, to to make that happen. And one other thing, as it relates to that, people tend to put deer breeders and high fence owners in the same category. Uh -huh. uh, I've heard from a bunch of high fence owners who are not happy that the deer breeders have brought negative attention to high fence operations. There are a lot of people in Mississippi who own high fence operations. And all they want is to keep trespassers off and be able to manage their deer properly. And uh, they're not happy that the deer breeders have brought negative attention to their high fences. That's for sure. Hey, when we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with Reed Geis. We'll see you after this. Right. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. This segment is brought to you by Jordan Blissett and Austin Seals from Open Season Properties. In a world where honest and honesty and dependability are rare, uh, Austin and Jordan stand out with their commitment to, to integrity and hard work. With a background in agriculture science, marketing, and hunting land development, that team offers a real service that you can rely on when buying or selling real estate. Whether it's your family property or your first piece of ground, they understand the significance of every transaction, specializing in recreational land, poultry farms, investment properties, farm and timber lands, and more. They are there to help meet all your real estate needs. Give them a call today and experience the difference with Austin Seals and Jordan Blissett of Open Seasons Properties today. Just thrilled to have them as a, as a presenting sponsor of Super Talk Outdoors. Now let's move back over to my friend Reed Geis. Sort of, uh, <laughs> he's been all over the world fly fishing, holds a bunch of state records in Mississippi. He's just an outdoorsman. Who, uh, who watches what's going on in our state and someone I, I, I really look forward to having this conversation with today. Reed, when you think about what the opening of the Bonnie Carey Spillway and, uh, did to the, the Mississippi Sound, it's, it's incredible, but people should know more about that. So why don't you uh, tell them about the Bonnie Carey Spillway and what it is, and then I'll, I'll fill in some, some spaces that maybe you forget to mention. Sure, yeah. When the Mississippi River uh, exceeds uh, 125 million cubic feet per second, they open the Bonnie Carey Spillway. In the past, they've never had to think about us over here. Well, I'll tell you what it did in 2019, destroyed our oyster reefs. It, uh, it killed so many marine mammals and turtles. The, the sight of those dead animals and dying animals uh, is seared into my brain. Um, I saw some of these turtles uh, uh, during that, that time period, and uh, out in Curlew, saw a, an animal dying, saw a, 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 a bottlenose dolphin dying. It just um, uh, it, it, it seared, it, as I said, it seared my soul to see something like that. You know, it, until now, they've never had, the Corps of Engineers has never had to think about what it does to the Mississippi Sound. But the, the Save Our Sound Coalition was able to go to court and now they must consider us. Now, I, I don't know if they're gonna consider us and say, okay, we considered you, we're opening it up again anyhow, but they must consider us. Um, so it, 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 in that case, it took, um, uh, it, it, it took um, 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 a lot, you know, going to lawyers and going to court to make it happen. But there's a lot I think that we can do just to make everyone aware now um, of, of what's going on. Then you have the, the Barataria um, um, uh, diversion. Uh, I understand it comes online soon. Um, that could possibly be stopped uh, by legal means. Um, it's just it could destroy our way of life down here. When you, you when you hear the sound of oysters being dropped 
on the um go ahead go ahead ray we can hear you okay uh when you hear the sound of empty oysters and what that clunk uh and then those oyster reefs in Pan haven't come back um uh you know, it's, it's interesting that, that um, we talked also about the Brett and the Sound diversion down down there. Um, that's going to go into Brett and the Sound chandelier. That's going to be dumping water day in and day out, 24-7. They just call it fresh water. It's not. It's just water with no salt. It comes from the Mississippi River. It's essentially is the cesspool of 38 states in our nation by the time it gets here. You know what it's done off the mouth of Mississippi to the west. It, there's a dead zone the size of, of Rhode Island. Um, if that happened here to us, it would absolutely end our way of life. Uh, it's something we've got to pay attention to. So, so, to, so to bring into clear uh, focus, for people who've taken that drive from New Orleans to Baton Rouge, you actually at one point drive across the Bonacary Spillway. And the way it worked is, as Reed pointed out, is that when the, the river reached a certain level, in order to protect New Orleans, what they would do is take the pressure off the Mississippi River by opening that spillway and pouring that uh, that highly nutrified, highly uh, polluted fresh water into Lake Pontchartrain, then it goes into Lake Bourne, and then eventually into the Mississippi Sound. And that one year that 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 uh, that we had mentioned, and two times in one year they opened that up. So it just it just created this massive impact to the Mississippi Sound. Ultimately led to an algae bloom, and you can only know that the impact on tourism on uh, the economy of coastal Mississippi was was very very significant. This Save the Sound Coalition has really had some really good success, Reed, because what they have def- what they have won is not just that they had to consider uh, the Mississippi Sound and future openings, but they have to consider alternatives to that. So what we before we thought there's only two spillways: the Maganza, which they're really scared at opening that would create some undermining. Um, that would actually change the direction of the Mississippi River if that were to occur. And then, and then of course, the Bonnie Carey Spillway. But we've learned that actually further up the river, there are some other opportunities right. to release some, some pressure off of the Mississippi River. So they're going to have to consider all of these things. And ultimately, we're going to have to seek a solution. Uh, one of the biggest solutions is to dig the Mississippi River deeper. You know, that's, that's something that we need to think about. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know there 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 are going to be other things they 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 talk about, but you know some of these solutions could be hundreds of billions of dollars, and and, and yeah. it's a it's a very significant issue that that we'll be facing, as it relates to uh, the Breton Sound Diversion Project. What that is about is creating Louisiana has lost a lot of land over many years. And what they're trying to do with these diversion projects is create new land to try to protect Louisiana by creating this land. The way they do it is let the Mississippi fl- River flow into these areas so that the sediment and other things can uh, can gather up. But what it means for us that enjoy fishing uh, the Chandelier Islands, the Breton Sound especially, and the oil rigs in, in that general vicinity – uh, what will happen there will be exactly what what we experienced after the the Bonnie Carey was open in, in in the Mississippi Sound would be that the saltwater species in those areas will be just literally wiped out, and you know it you know if it, it ends up impacting all of Chandelier, can you imagine what that means to to our ability to enjoy that as this incredible natural resource off the coast of Mississippi? Uh, it's hard to get your head around, isn't it? It really is. And, and, you know, this would also uh, uh, goes into Delacro, all those places that we fish in South Louisiana and destroy them. And, and again, it's not it's not fresh water. It's just water. It doesn't have salt in it. That's some filthy, filthy stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, those areas, we depend on those areas uh, for uh, uh, nurseries, you know, for our shrimp and our fish. We, we have to have those areas. And, and this would I guess we would have to destroy the the, uh, the marsh to save the marsh. Come on, you know it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, you know they're going to spend like over uh, already. They've spent over a hundred million dollars looking at this diversion down there in, in Breton Sound. Um, Restore Act money. Yeah, they spent thirty million uh, Restore Act funds to um, save our um, our oysters here after the BP spill. Then of course you know this would kill it again. You know, so spending money 
it, it, it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Well, you think about, listen, Reed, um, for people people who fish down here, they, they can appreciate this, but you, if you have the coast of Mississippi and then off the coast, you have our Barry Islands, of course, Dauphin Island over in Alabama, and then you get to Petty Boys and then Horn and then Ship and then Cat. And Cat actually almost butts up against Louisiana Marsh. And if you follow the Louisiana Marsh down, think of Cat as sort of being the northern portion of this. And then to the west, you have the Louisiana Marsh. As you go further south, then sort of the, the outer barrier, the eastern barrier is the Chandelier Islands. And in between all of those areas are some of the best fishing in the world for speckled trout and redfish and whatever else. These are the areas that are going to be impacted by uh, these diversion projects. And, um, you know, this is, they're barreling ahead, Reed. You know, I hope yeah. that something can be done to, to slow it down so we can think more about this. It may take legal action, um, uh, but it, it something has to happen. All of that marshland, again, that, that we wouldn't have shrimp anymore if they kill all that. Shrimp would be gone. Uh, yeah. All the oysters would be gone. And in Louisiana, Louisiana oysters will be gone. Yeah. Um, pretty soon, uh, it, it, but then when we start getting the algae blooms, tourism dies. Um, it, it, it literally will, will destroy our way of life. It, yeah. It, well, <laughs> we uh, we've got a lot to think about as it re as it relates to that, and let's hope that the the Save the Sound Coalition and and their efforts will stay focused on it. Uh, they've been on my other show, uh, wow. the Ricky Matthews Show, talking about it. I think that Gerald Blessy and the team that surrounds him, and of course Moby Solange from the Marine Mammal Institute. Those guys are all all in. And you know what's interesting? I mean, the counties and cities have all contributed to this effort and the states involved. And uh, I think people generally understand that if we don't go at this in an organized way, we could be we could be impacted in a, in a great way. Hey, when we come back on the other side, we're going to talk just a little bit about as we barrel towards summer, some great fishing in Mississippi. Let's talk about what Reed likes to do the most of as it relates to Mississippi. We'll see you after this break. From the Open Season Property Studio, welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors as we continue to visit with my friend Reed Geis, who uh, made, a, made a long career as a marketing executive ad agency owner, still do, does work today, and uh, he's he's been literally all over the world fly fishing. He just loves the outdoors. Hey, Reed, when you think about summer approaching uh -huh. What's some of the things you look most forward to as it relates to fishing in South Mississippi? Well, you know, I, one thing I love to do is wade on the barrier islands and uh, uh, sight cast to those big redfish and, and and the black drum. You know, black drum will not eat a fly. It's hard to get them to eat a fly. If you really catch a, a black drum, wow, you know, that's a big deal around here to catch a black drum on a fly. But the redfish, uh, I just just love getting out there amongst them and being with them right there in the water. Of course, uh, the triple tail will be coming in soon. And that, that's something I love to target, particularly with the fly rod. You know, you see that, that fish laying up next to a, a buoy and uh, it casts a little bit behind him. Don't, don't get the line. No, don't catch the line. <laughs> <laughs> and bring that past their nose. They're going to eat and they fight like a... Well, they fight like, you know, eight pound bluegill. If they do. All the time, Imagine well, that. Bluegill. Yeah, if these bluegill any bigger, you couldn't <laughs> catch them. Well, that's what triple tail are. They're giant, giant bluegill. They're so much fun. And we got cobia coming too, you know, and um, I like to get, when we go out there snapper fishing, if we're chumming, um, then, you know, many times a cobia will come up to the boat. And again, they love a fly. They'll eat a fly in a second. Yeah, I love doing all those things. Uh, one of the things as it relates to redfish, you have to have a boat to do this. Of course, you have to have a boat in most cases to get to the Barrier Islands. But the, the reality is when you get find the schooling redfish, when, when the school, try to describe the mayhem of acres of schooling redfish. Oh, my gosh. And so uh, you, you see a school, you try to catch a uh, cast towards the first one. Uh, you don't want to cast in the middle because it might freak them out. But as soon as you hook that fish, yeah, everything just breaks loose, as they say. And uh, the other fish will spend a lot of time trying to take away, take it away from him. You know, you got something good to eat, I want it. They're sitting there following him right by the mouth trying to get another. In fact, 
many times that'll be a technique. I'll be out there with my, my brother or someone. We'll be out there fly fishing and, okay, I got one. Here, one's following it. And you, the other person catches the one following it. You get rid of yours and, whoa, there's one following that one. Um, <laughs> you can do that for maybe a half hour you know, or an hour or so before they you really wise up. Yeah, that's fun. Absolutely, absolutely crazy. Um, and then, of course, when you get to a, go to an oil rig, uh, as soon as the water starts heating up, there's a wide variety of stuff that you can be in, be engaged in, isn't there? Oh, exactly. Um, uh, uh, for example, the the uh, a mangrove snapper uh, and mutton snapper, you know, that hang out there. Yeah, they're difficult to catch, but they'll take a fly. They'll take a fly on on uh, if as long as it's dropping at the same same level as, as the chum you throw out there. Uh, as long as it seems real, they'll eat it. Yeah, Reed, it is a it is with summer coming, so much to look forward to. I I just love it. And of course, you know, the backwater fishing of coast of Mississippi, uh, up until this most recent rain, some of the, with the salinity levels were up there. We were catching specks and redfish and big flounder. Hopefully this rain wasn't enough to kind of completely mess it up and it will settle back down again. But I don't you know, look at the water color right now. It's pretty brown out there, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I'm, I can see it from here. And yeah, it, it looks like sort of coffee to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We had such hey. a we had we had such a long stretch in, in uh, coastal Mississippi, where you know the backwaters. You think about the bayous, and you know, like like in our case, um, Biloxi Bay, and then going up to Shudika Bluff or Biloxi River. Those are all you know part of a of a fl watershed. You know, so when it rains, all that rain eventually makes its way into Biloxi Bay and then eventually out into the Mississippi Sound. We've been really, really lucky the last couple of years with, you know, not having to deal with too much rain. And right. years before that, there was so much fresh water in um, in Back Bay, there was hardly any uh, any bait fish. And if you don't right. have bait fish, you're not going to have other fish. So it's we've a little bit spoiled the last year or so, haven't we, Ben? Yeah, you know, I keep, I keep lights on my pier. And uh, in the times you're talking about, it was nothing was there, nothing. I'd go out there at night with my fly rod and catch them and release speckled trout. Almost all of them are too small um, off the pier, but um, uh, that's a lot of fun too. And I miss them when they're not there, where there's too much rain. Yeah, so uh, you, actually before this last rain, it was starting to get good, I bet. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was finally starting to get good. <laughs> and, uh, but boy, this storm that came through, man, oh, man. If it, you know what I refer to it as kind of a small tropical storm. It's, it was, yeah, it I was, think a tropical storm uh, 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 it had the fury of a tropical storm. I'm surprised it wasn't named. I know. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> name. <laughs> I said the same thing when I was cleaning my pool and cleaning my yard. You, you, it might as well have been named because that's what it felt like uh, on my back for sure. Reed Geis, it's been a pleasure to catch up with you. Hey, man, thanks for staying focused and paying attention. Sure. Yeah, man, absolutely. I'll be watching it and I'll be listening. You bet, man. You bet. This has been Reed Geis. So, uh, listen, have a great day. And uh, as I always end every show, stay safe when you're in the outdoors. Stay safe. And we will see you next week. God bless you.